Welcome to the Massage Tools Podcast, your home for cool interviews and reviews. Hey, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Thank um, you for having me. Will you give us uh, maybe your, your, your origin story? What brought you to massage therapy? What was kind of your calling? And uh, maybe some of your background as far as schooling goes? Okay. I, uh, I was an athlete in high school. And so I think there was always, I wanted to do something um, that had to do with sports. Um, and I didn't really know about massage, honestly. Um, I worked at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln for five years and got to know some of the athletes there. And I worked on some of them just for fun. Didn't know what I was doing, but apparently it worked. Um, and then I did get my first massage in Lincoln. Um, the other thing too, whenever I say that I started working with friends, my, my girlfriend I've known since second grade always reminds me that I worked on our teammates in high school at Travis. And I, to this day, have no idea what she's talking about. I don't remember that at all. So maybe it was a natural thing. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so I moved to, I moved to Seattle and my aerobics instructor, um, she was always doing these things at the end of end of uh, her sessions and it was jostling and i talked to her one time and she said um it has to do with sports massage I'm like oh i've kind of thought about that before and she introduced me to seattle massage school who had a five-week class and you took that and and learned a full body massage and decided whether or not you wanted to continue so I took it and I worked for an uh, international insurance broker at the time. And so I worked on some of my uh, colleagues there and I wanted to see if I liked touching people and if people liked me touching them. And it seemed to work out well. And so I went to school at Seattle Massage School um, in 1988. I graduated in 1989. Okay, awesome. And you've been in the industry pretty much since? I have. Okay. It actually, um, when I first started, I was planning on getting married and he and I had talked, I thought, oh, you know, I could do massage part time. And, and once we have kids and stuff, and then by the time school was out, we were no longer together. And then it just kind of took off and it's been a career. It wasn't, it wasn't something that I had planned, but, um, apparently it's where I'm supposed to be because it's been good to me. I've done quite a few things with it. So. Awesome. Will you, uh, will you tell us some of the things that you've done? Okay. So, um, like I said, I worked for an international insurance broker and they had given space to a group called amputee soccer international. And one of the women that I worked with was on the board and another one was a player and they knew that I was interested in sports massage. And so as I got closer to graduating, um, they asked me if I would put together a sports massage team for the World Cup, which was going to be in Seattle. And two weeks after I got out of school, I wasn't even licensed yet. Um, I got the okay though. So um, I put together some of my classmates and some people that I knew um, that were uh, massage therapists at practice. And um, that's how I got started. And We, the World Cup that year, I think we had seven teams, um, El Salvador, Brazil, England, um, the Soviet Union, Canada, the US, I think I'm forgetting somebody. But so what we did is we just set up tables. There was an indoor and an outdoor tournament. And we set up tables, we worked on everybody. We didn't just work on the US team, we worked on everybody from every country. So that got started there. And then I also got involved with, the Washington sports massage team as well. And um, in 1990, we had the Goodwill Games in Seattle. And um, I helped, I didn't actually do massage there. I actually helped with the housing because the AMTA had a national sports massage team at that time. And they um, came in from all over the country to work during the games. And so we were able to get a sorority house to house them in. It was pretty cool. It had a nice big kitchen. One of our massage therapists was a cook. Oh, wow. You know? Yeah. So he made meals and he made lunches every day. And then we figured out transportation and everything. So um, that, that, was, that was kind of the beginning of what happened. And then 
with um, amputee soccer, I continued on with that uh, and then took a break while I raised my daughter, stayed in touch with a couple of the guys and got involved again a couple of years ago. So I'm glad to be back with them. It's great. So amputee soccer, adaptive athletes, that's kind of, um, it's a pretty, pretty niche uh, area of massage therapy. Is there like, <clears throat> obviously you kind of got an early start into it, but um, if someone has a curiosity in that vein of massage, what, uh, how do you start to direct them? Cause I normally work with, um, regular athletes to, to right. put it. And so I guess, you know, transitioning into, into that niche, like what's some good advice you'd have for individuals? Well, I'll tell you what happened with me is I started, like I said, with amputee soccer, and then somebody had told me about wheelchair basketball. So I went to one of those games and met a couple guys. And one of the guys was a wheelchair racer. And so I started working with him as well. So I went to AMTA's convention. And when I got home, I sent them a letter and said, hey, this is what I'm doing. I'd like to learn more at next convention. Could you have somebody teach? And after a few months, I got a respond back and they said, we can't find anybody. Will you teach it? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So I got a hold of people. I got a hold of Whitney Lowe, everybody that I could think of that maybe would know that there was a book or a class or something out there. Nobody could find anything. So I basically um, found some books on training people who are um, in wheelchairs or um, just the adaptive part of how they do that. And then basically took what I knew and figured out how to adapt it to um, a, a different uh, a, uh, adaptive player and started, obviously the best thing to do is to watch their form and figure out, okay, what is it that they need? If it's an amputee, is it um, below the knee? Is it above the knee? Is it an arm? Is it a hand? and figure out how their posture changes and then depending on what their sport is. So that's where I got started was teaching it because if you want to learn something, teach it. So I did that at convention a couple of times, uh, national and then as well as in Washington, um, New Jersey. And that's something that I want to get back into. So as far as getting into that, as far as training, there's really not a lot out there that I know of. Um, Fortunately, the Paralympics are starting to be a little bit more well known. And that's, I think that is where so many, they, they need more therapists for that. I just did the two week uh, volunteer stint rotation um, at the Colorado Springs um, Olympic Paralympic site just before COVID shut it down. So I oh, got wow. in there just in the nick of time. Yeah. Um, and so I was able to work with some of them. I was able to talk to some of the people there. And you know, one of the women, I told her, I want to start teaching again. What do you think? And she's like, oh, please, we need more people to understand this a little bit better. Because like at the Paralympics, not only do you have people who have amputations or are in wheelchairs, um, you've also uh, got people that maybe have CP. They're on the high, high end. And there's different ways to work with that. I remember at the Paralympics in 96, there was a, a girl who was um, doing the finals, I believe in the 100. And you know, usually with sports massage, you get them all jazzed up and ready to go. And the coach said, make her as calm as possible. And it's like, oh, well, that makes sense. Yeah. But so it's little things like that that you don't think of. It's not exactly the same as what we were used to doing with sports massage. So there's those little things. So. I am hoping within the, this, this next year that I get my class. I've still got everything that I used to teach, um, but I want to start doing that again as well so that people that are interested in this um, will have some place to go. And then at some point before I die, I have to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I've started it a few times, but it has never gotten to the end. So. Okay. Yeah, I had the... Um the privilege I, I did a rotation in 2013 at Colorado Springs as well and my first experience with an, adapt, an adaptive athlete was a downhill scare you know yeah. spina bifida and yeah. fortunately he was probably he was the perfect client to have for that situation because he's like 
hey, I got spina bifida. I can't, I don't have any control of my legs. And so I'm just going to hop up on the table. I need some work on my back. Let's go. And I'm like, all right, cool, man. So he, he popped on and, you know, because of the nature of the, the disease, you know, he's, his legs were just, they looked to me what was in an uncomfortable position. I'm like, do I'm going to bolster this or whatever? He's like, nope, just let him fly loose. I don't really care. And I'm like, all right, cool. <laughs> like he exactly. obviously with a lifetime of, of dealing with that, he's, yeah, that that's his that's his mechanism for helping people, and it was perfect because the other adaptive athletes that came in after that, it was just really easy. I'm like, oh yeah, they're just like every other athlete that rolls through. There's just nuances to what I have to do, but that right. was. Uh, and that's what so many I I teach at um, the uh, community college here, and um, one of the classes I teach is is introduction to massage, and then we have a massage program now, and so then I'll do a weekend workshop on sports massage. And I always throw the adaptive part in. And I will have um, some of my wheelchair racers or amputee or somebody come in along with other athletes that I know um, and have the, have the students work on them at the end of that. And one thing that people always ask, well, if somebody's in a wheelchair, how do you get them on the table? Ask them if they need help. They know their body. They've been doing this for a long time, you know? so. And maybe they don't want to get on the table. I don't need my legs done. I just need my shoulders done. Can I stay in my chair? Sure. So I think that's the biggest thing. Just like our other clients, they know their body. They're living in it. Ask them what they need. You know, don't don't offer help um, and say, oh, well, here, let, let me lift that for you. Let me move this for you. Let, no, they'll ask them if they need any help, you know. Um, the other thing too is if you have someone either in a wheelchair or perhaps you have um, uh, a shorter person, the best thing to do too is to sit down, get on their eye level or kneel or whatever, so you don't feel like you're towering over them. So I think that's those are a couple of the of the uh, things that I think people need to know. Okay. But, yeah. um, I worked the, the Olympics and the Paralympics in '96 and. Um, the Paralympics was just amazing. The Olympics were great, but Paralympics were just, you know, people would win uh, medals and after they get their pictures and everything, they'd come back and hand out their flowers to everybody that worked on them and put the medal around our neck and say, this is yours as much as ours and stuff. So it was, it's pretty rewarding. It's rewarding. That is on one of my list of events. I'd, I'd love to work yeah. a, a pair summer or winter. doesn't matter. So USO PC, if you're listening. <laughs> Here we are. Here we are. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ready to go. Ready to go. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Have there been other courseworks that you've found really beneficial or practitioners we should track down uh, to take courses with? As far as sports massage or just anything in general? Your choice. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, I also work with special needs kids. Okay. <laughs> so one course that I learned about working with them is called the Moskatova method. Okay. And it works with um, uh, the primary reflexes. So when kids are developing and they don't quite get through that, there's things that you can do to help them. And the nice thing about that, um, that program as well is that can also be used with people that maybe have had a stroke and maybe they've lost some of those um, skills. So that's one, it's, it's a little pricey. Um, if I was planning to do it, you know, full time, I would definitely go for it, but I've taken a few classes and have really seen how much that has helped with um, special needs as well as some people who maybe have had some kind of a brain injury whether it's a car accident or a bicycle accident they're not thinking clearly or their arm just doesn't move like it used to so that that's one that I think a lot of people don't know about um, but again if you're if you're if you're doing Swedish and deep tissue and sports massage those are the things you're looking for um, as far as as far as uh, uh, instructors I know when I was listening to Tom's interview I'm like yep me too Danny <laughs> Whitney you know going through the same ones mm -hmm. but he and I have been around for a while <laughs> so those are the ones we bounce back to okay yeah. and you know, Jim James Waslowski and you know anything orthopedic I think is really important I think that's one of the main things that I tell my students make sure number one take a cadaver lab 
Number two, get into orthopedics, um, whether it's with Whitney Lowe or even with Paul St. John, with the St. John method. That was one of my, I, that was one of my first ones. I won, uh, I was given an, uh, a scholarship award through the sports massage team in Washington. So I was able to take those classes. And I think that made a huge difference. Looking at people's posture, understanding how they're walking and why and what can be sweat fixed and things like that. Um, that's something that I always tell my students, keep doing that, keep doing those classes because things change. We, um, we find out different things about what's going on. So, uh, that's, that's, that's my story. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, it's a pretty comprehensive list. And one of the reasons, you know, I, I had Tom on is he's been in the industry a long time. He mentioned you told me to have you on been around the industry for a little while. So it's, it's nice. Cause, um, and, and Tom and I talked about this at one point where you do have, uh, the new device comes out or the new tool or the new method or whatnot. And, and yeah. sometimes it's just rehashing or rebranding somebody else's yeah. stuff. And, uh, you guys have kind of seen and been able to put into practice over years what what's working for you at least. But if it's right. been enough time, it's like, oh, there's got to be some truth to it. So it's right. part of the reason I... Well, and I know that's one thing too. Um, I remember being at convention and watching Benny doing kinesio taping as demonstrations and stuff. So I'd watch that. And my daughter, is, she's actually a college athlete at this point, but at that time she was younger and, and she ran track, played volleyball. And occasionally, you know, she had, she had injuries. And so I would ask him questions and I finally just got a book and started figuring it out. And then I decided to take the course and I was blown away at how much is involved in it. And it's made such a difference. You know, I, when my daughter was in high school, I would work on a lot of her friends. Um, and even, I mean, when I went to a track meet, I had a mat, I had kinesio tape. I had all this stuff just in case, you know, and some of the, some of the kids, they expected, they knew that I was going to be there and it's like, can you stretch me out before this event? But, um, the kinesio tape has helped me, you know, I've got a knee problem. It's helped me. I can do that on myself. So, um, that's one of those courses too, that you look at and think, oh, I can do that. It's not that big of a deal or cupping you know, things like that. And then you take the class and you read, or, or even sometimes watching something on YouTube and you realize, wow, there's a little bit more to this than what I expected. So yeah, some of those tools that come out, you kind of have to look at them or ask people that you trust if they've used them, what they think about them. But I've added a few tools to my, to my room um, in the past couple of years. So like what? <laughs> well, the kinesio tape. Sure. Um, Gua tool. Okay. Cupping and a hypervolt. Okay. I love the hypervolt. That's a, that's yeah. a fun one. It, it is, you know, and with my daughter, she, she runs track at Penn state and they use, I think they use the Theragun out there, but she was like, oh my gosh, mom, this is wonderful. And, and so of course, can I have yours, mom? No, you can't have mine, but, <laughs> but, um, Dix now has a mini Theragun. And it's just like a, a shape of a triangle and, mm -hmm. you know, one setting. And so I bought that for her, especially now, since they can't get into the weight room, they can't get treatment, they can't do anything. She's got her own. She can take care of herself if she needs to. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I got the hypervolt kind of in that early wave of the percussion, mm -hmm. percussion massage tools and whatnot. And I've enjoyed it. It's, I've, I've found some material, uh, kind of gives a little more of the physiology behind it and what's potentially going on. So once I filled in the mechanism, that's what I needed for implementation a little bit more. Like the result's good, but I'm like, how much am I just shaking and just kind of, right. you know, buzzing one it out? Thing, yeah. One thing that I've used that on as well are some of my special needs kids because so many of them have dystonia okay. and they just get so tight and then that's painful. Mm -hmm. um, I've got one little girl, she'll get like that. And I just kind of roll her to her side and, and just do it up and down her back. And she just completely calms down. And then I've got another kid I use it on and then he just giggles the whole time. So we don't use that anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, it's good. It's, um, it, you have such a fascinating, two fascinating niches so far. I'm just like, keep talking, keep talking. <laughs> um, I'm sure more will come up, but 
kind of in the in the lines of education is there i mean you mentioned cadaver and i feel cadaver should be part of massage training although at the moment it's it's not traditional is there anything else that wasn't or isn't really considered necessarily a massage thing that's been beneficial to your career um it's a good question i feel like i went to school so long ago (laughs) that you know some of these things that come up now um we never learned then i think one thing that i tell my students um and that i wish i would have done more of is the business side i don't i don't even remember if we had a class on owning your own business you know now they have more of that but writing a business plan and um, uh, taking classes so that you understand you know and now we're taking credit cards we're doing it on our phone what so some of those things some of the you know when tom and i were growing up we had three channels on tv um and the phone was attached to the wall so uh i think just keeping up with um technology and the marketing and things like that are are important um as far as training i think i kind of touched on what i think some of the training the good training is the other thing is get to be part of a group whether it's amta abmp uh, facebook groups for massage therapist um, sports massage if there's other things you're interested in i'm even on a a a facebook page with um, moms who are moms of special needs kids and i don't necessarily comment on those things but I get information from them. You know, my kid is having this problem, who knows what doctor, who knows what surgery, whatever, you know, so that helps me. Um, even sometimes they'll, they'll mention a, a, a disorder and I'm like, what is that? So thank God for Google. Yes. So, so it makes a huge difference. So I, I think, and I, I tell my students now, you know, if there's something that you come across, look it up, share it with the class. You know, it's all out there. I I teach um, so that my students are uh, informed on the medical side. When I was in Washington, we were considered healthcare providers. I moved to Colorado, and there's not even licensure. Hmm. There's not registration. There's nothing, and so that totally changed. You know, like who are these people? You know how. <laughs> what are they doing? You know? And so I have stuck with, I am a healthcare provider. Um, I know people are always asking about, you know, how much do you get tipped? And I'm like, I tell people, I don't want to tip. I'm a healthcare provider, unless you're tipping your dentist and your surgeon. Um, I, I want to be, I, I want to be considered on that level. And so when I teach, I teach them, um, more of the medical side so that if, if, if they go into spa, that's fine. Um, if they, sometimes they might have, uh, somebody that had a car accident and you've got to be able to write a report that a doctor's going to understand and that you can talk the same, that same language. Yeah, that's great, great advice. Um, definitely can definitely echo the, uh, the healthcare provider side of it. I was fortunate that my training was skewed heavily towards um, really like uh, integrative practices. So they taught us to communicate with other professionals and move out. Right. And in the, my office here, like through the wall behind me is a, a physical therapist's office. And, you know, people will see her and then walk over to see me and then go to tip. I'm like, did you tip the PT? And they're like, no. And I'm like, why not? They're like, well, I'm like, yeah, I appreciate the effort, but <laughs> you know. yeah, yeah, that's yeah. I I work in an office with a chiropractor too. And actually when I started in Seattle, I worked with a chiropractor and then I went to another office and worked with a chiropractor. And it was so nice just to be able to um, share the same clients, um, but also get permission from the the client, of course, or patient and be able to talk to each other about what did you find, or this is what I found and things like that. And I love that now too. I'm working with um, a chiropractor that I've gone to for 10 years went to his dad before that and um, just being able to do that. But it's the same thing. Did, did you tip him? Like, no. Okay. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Look at me at that same realm. So. Yeah, you've, um, 
you, you mentioned a lot of advice that you like to give to your students and you sort of touched on a little bit, but if you could travel back in time and be like, Hey, you need to study this sooner. Is, is there anything that stands out? You're like, gosh, I wish I knew this in my first year of massage. Um, I, I think the biggest thing, like I had mentioned was business. Okay. I don't think that because I've always been self-employed, you know, so, uh, learning that, I think that was probably the biggest thing. You know, it was funny. You ask a, a couple of things like what advice would you give yourself and what are pros and cons and the cons and, and what I would tell myself. I really didn't think about that. Um, I went to a good school and I've done a lot of continuing ed and I feel, I, I think one of the things is, is, you know, always study anatomy, always, always, always. Um, and like I said, the business plan, but I think those are things that we just have to keep up on and research. There's so much out there now. And that, that may be something that I wish I would have done more of when I first started as well, is, is learned more about the research. Of course, it's changed so much. There's so much more out there now, you know? And so that's good. The other thing too, and this wasn't from before, but this is something now that um, I stress as well, um, keeping up with medications and their side effects. I know a few years back, somebody wrote a book on um, pharma, pharmacology and massage. Mm -hmm. And I point, uh, I, I, I talk about that too in my classes and look a few of the, these up that people continue to take. And what kind of an effect it has on each of the organs, if we should be doing a certain kind of massage or not. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an awareness thing. And the nice thing too, is there's apps now that have um, medications and side effects, you know? Again, that's the medical side, but it's important. That's something we didn't talk about when I went to school. Okay. Yeah, that's a really, really good good tip, piece of advice. It's like the physician's desk reference, the acupuncturist desk reference, they're all digital now. So there's a right. lot of resources available to us. So use them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So you touched on it early on out, but you said you teach some continuing education or, or hoping to get back to that? I'm hoping to get back to it. The okay. only thing I've taught continuing ed was um, the uh, sports massage for adaptive athletes or specifically for amputees, because that's who I work with mostly. Sure. Um, sure. So I, I used to do that. And then, like I said, I had a child and we moved to Colorado and I wasn't really around. I'm up in Fort Collins. Um, I'm not in Denver, so that's where most of that sports, the adaptive sports happens. And so I just kind of put that on the shelf for a while. Um, but now, now that I'm back with amputee soccer and realized that's my passion, that's how much I love. And, and things have changed in that world as well. And we've got different players. We still have a couple of players that were playing when I played, when I, when I worked with them before. Um, but it's something that I think, and, and talking to people at the, the Olympic Training Center, they said the same thing, people don't know what to do. And I remember being at the Paralympics in 96, and there were very few people, very few therapists. Anybody that wanted to come, they said come. And there was a lady there doing relaxation massage. I'm like, what are you doing? Well, I just want them to relax. And I'm like, no, 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 we're doing sports massage. Like, well, I don't know sports massage. Like, then why are you here? You know, so I think a lot of people um, don't understand that or people that, are, like you said, are in sports massage. How do you, do you treat them differently or how do you treat it? Or what are you looking for? And, you know, somebody in a wheelchair, if they've got pressure sores or anything like that. So um, I, I just, I want to get back into that. I'm learning more. I've done this for a while. Um, now I have some great people to talk to again. Um, so I, I definitely want to get back into that. As far as the college right now, I'm not doing any continuing ed with that yet. Um, that's just an intro. And then part of the um, massage program, I do a couple of workshops, the sports massage and pregnancy and infant massage. And then I just started last year teaching pathology for massage therapists. And this year I took over the ethics for integrative health. So yeah. And that's online. I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> it's, it's like so. the Koopman School of Massage. <laughs> I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. 
So uh, diving a little deeper into adaptive uh, or amputee soccer, is there, I guess, what are some of the, the pros and cons to working an event with them? Like, I'm sure it's different than a, um, you know, some of the other sports events that you've mentioned, but like, what's, what was kind of a, a really positive, unique situation out of it? We'll start with that, that question. Well, I think part of it was like you had mentioned, it's different. It's not the Olympic athletes. It's not, it's, it's, it's a little bit different. And a lot of these athletes, um, Paralympic athletes were athletes before they, um, for instance, amputee soccer, before they lost their limb. Um, some of them played soccer and now they've had to learn how to, um, play it again, but on two crutches and one leg or um, our goalies are missing a part of an arm, whether it's a hand or the entire arm or whatever. So, um, you know, that's, that's the tricky little thing is if you want to score on them, shoot for the side that they don't have an arm on. Sure. You know, so there's those, those little things too. Um, I think for me, the biggest thing is, is the, the uh, postural side of it. You know, is somebody wearing a prosthetic leg um, is it fitting correctly? How are they walking? Um, and then if you've got somebody who doesn't wear a prosthetic leg, they're on crutches all the time. Then they go out and play hardcore and then they go back to their crutches. So yeah, so their back, their arms, their foot, their, you know, all these different, different things. And I guess it's kind of that puzzle. I always like to kind of put that puzzle together. And when we were in excuse me, in Mexico two years ago for World Cup, I told the guys, I may be following you down the street and I may be videotaping you walking. I just want you to know. You know, I said, I'm gonna use that for myself, but I also may use that in classes. So, so they know that's going on, but it was very interesting. Um, and I think that's something that, that, that uh, any massage therapist, if they're watching posture, you know, like some of the guys would be walking and I'm like, so how's that low back feeling? Look at me. How did you know my low back hurt? Well, you know, watch that, that, that shift or this one guy needed a new leg. And so his knee would pop out. So he'd have to catch himself. And so, so being able to work with that as well. Um, are there any cons to it? Not really. This, this is, this is my passion. This is my baby. We haven't seen each other now in a year. We were in Costa Rica a year ago and then we had a tournament that we were supposed to play with Jamaica, Haiti, and Dominican Republic, but apparently Haiti couldn't get visas out of the country, so we canceled that in February, postponed it, and then COVID hit. So all of our training camps and everything else, and I'll tell you, we're kind of missing each other. You know, we kind of get to be a family. We stay in touch. Um, the coaches have been sending videos for them to do drills. Um, uh, I made a video on how to do self sports massage. Um, and they, you know, I always take all my tools with me, a uh, Theracane and a back roller and all these different things. So, um, those things disappear every once in a while. I'm like, okay, who took this? <laughs> Who's got it in their room? You need to bring it back. Other people want to use it. Um, so, so that has been, that that's probably been the hardest part right now is not being able to, to all work together and be together playing and working on them. Um, we have our head coach is uh, also a physical therapist and he teaches. I think he's the dean of the department out in New York. And um, our athletic trainer is also a physical therapist who also teaches at the same place. Okay. So we've got a really nice um, medical establishment with the team as well. So they're, they're taken care of pretty well. They can get stretched and taping and muscle testing and massage and everything. Um, I think probably the best thing right now, when I first started, it was fun working with all the different teams. There were seven countries. We worked with everybody. The fun thing too is going back to Mexico two years ago. Some of those guys were still there from Brazil and England and, you know, we're all a little bit more gray and we got <laughs> kids and all that stuff. It's kind of funny. Um, but it is nice to be able to focus just on the, the USA team. I really get to know each of them, um, how they lost their limb, what kind of problems they have, 
um, watching the game and saying, oh, got to hit that when we get done. Um, but, you know, just like I said before, too, they know their body. They know what's going on with it. And a lot of times they, you know, oh, I need work on this hamstring or um, this hand because somebody ran into them, you know, and crutched them or something. So um, it, it's a different dynamic, definitely. I've never been a soccer person. And I'll be honest, I watch soccer now sometimes. And it's so boring compared to amputee soccer. <laughs> It's just, I'll, I'll give you the website and you can watch some of the games. It's just amazing. The other part of it too, like I said, there were seven teams back in 86 to 89, 90. And now there are 44 countries involved. Turkey has 27 teams alone. Wow. Yeah. So when amputee soccer started, it was more of a rehab type of thing. And now it is straight out competition. There's still some rehab, but it's there's it's so competitive. It's just crazy to watch this. Um, but the nice thing too, it's like when we have our camps, we might have an open camp. And so if anybody knows of someone who's interested in trying it, they can come or we try to get kids in because we need to start building our team up again because um, we got some guys have been playing for 30 years, yeah. <laughs> you know? Uh, and when you're up against teams in from Turkey or Brazil or places that that have younger members, it gets a little bit tougher. Mm. So, yeah, I was uh, I was curious. Do uh, some of the international teams do they have a different name for what they call the sport? Or I mean, is it amputee football everywhere? Or <laughs> pretty, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 We're the only silly ones that call it soccer. Yeah. But that's okay. <laughs> Uh, I, I imagine, um, so I lived in Japan for about a year and they, they call it soccer. So I guess whenever they adopted it, they, it's the U S and Japan, or at least as of the early, early aughts, it was the U S and Japan and that's it. <laughs> but <laughs> our, our, our team starts calling it football. Well, I think when they're around other people as well. Yeah. So, but as far as the official name, it's still amputee soccer, sure. USA amputee soccer. So maybe someday we'll change it. It's just got to be spelled differently because we do have football. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. Is, are there any other uh, any other parting bits of wisdom you want to bestow on the listeners or anything um, you want to share? Or... Um, one thing that you had put, and I think that you had asked Tom this as well, as far as where we want to see massage going. That's my biggest country. question. I almost forgot it. <laughs> yeah. Um, when I thought about that, I think the biggest thing that I would like to see since I moved from Seattle, Colorado, is more um, consistency in, in training as well as licensure. So that it's not so difficult moving from one state to another. Like, do I have to take more schooling? Or like when I moved here, I, I called and I'm like, I called uh, the, the, the city and said, do I need to get a license or anything? And they said, um, well, we'd like you to get, I think it was a, a, a tax license or something, but we were not gonna charge you tax. <laughs> like, okay. And she said, um, have you had 500 hours or more? And I said, yeah, do you want me to bring the paperwork in? She goes, no, I trust you. <laughs> you don't know me, you don't know me, you know? So, so when it's that lax, I get a little concerned, okay. you know, but anyway, so I, and I know there's other people right now, Hey, I'm moving to Colorado from California or I'm going from Colorado to, and then you have to figure out what is their licensure requirements? Do they have licensure? Do I need more hours? And I wish that we could kind of come together with that a little bit more. Um, maybe, and, and I don't know how state to state we can be more consistent with, with schooling. Okay. Um, so many schools out there. Um, but I think that's the thing that I would like to see the most, just make it a little bit easier to go to a different state. All right. Um, so the, the reciprocity be, would, would be nice. Is there anything, um, and probably we'll end up rehashing some of the same points, but are there, are things within the curriculum that are like, man, like this state doesn't cover it at all, but this state does, or do you think just overall more training will probably catch what we we need to add into the the minimum or foundational training i i think sometimes too just even the curriculum i think everybody kind of 
covers everything, but they don't necessarily cover cover it enough. There's even um, a place here. I used to just go into like schools to into their student clinic just to get a massage, see see what they're doing, you know, talk to them and stuff. And there's one place that I went, I don't know, several times, and I always ask for work on my glutes. And they do a few compressions and then they move on. And so finally, the last time I was in, I asked her, do you guys learn how to do glute work? And she said, no, like not at all. Yeah, and this is this was a pricey, pricey uh, training. And I thought, wow, you know, how do you get away from that? And especially if you're gonna do sports massage, you know, this, this is the center, this runs everything. So I, I thought that was interesting. So I, I think that, and, and I don't know how we can do that, Here's the curriculum. All 50 states have to do this. You know, I, I people are going to think differently, east and west coast, Midwest. But I, I think just even the basics, you know, like I tell my students when they leave, you need to know, you know, they're like, well, I want to learn this and I want to learn this. Good. You would do that in continuing education. When you leave here, I want you to be able to do an amazing Swedish massage. I want you to have palpation skills. I want you to understand posture. A little bit at least to get through to get started and then you can do continuing ed but um you, you got to be awesome and I, I think we've done a really good job at our school i had somebody get a hold of me the other day she said she's been filling in for somebody who's been on maternity leave for like eight weeks she said she's very busy and and she said um, i had somebody in who's been getting massage for 20 years and they said this was the best massage i've ever had awesome. and she's been out of school for six months Awesome. Congratulations. So, like, <laughs> I, well, I said, that's what I want to hear. That's that way we know we're doing our job. Yeah. So, but I, but I just, I want to see more of that. I want to see really good therapists out there. We, we have to build our name back up. You know, mm -hmm. there's still some, some things that are floating around and it's like, that's not who we are. I'm not a masseuse. You know, I am a massage therapist and I'm a healthcare provider. So um, I, I think, I think that's probably one of the bigger things that I'm concerned about. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's a, you know, it's kind of one of those, you're, I think the fifth, fifth individual I've interviewed. Cause I did a couple kind of tandem podcasts, but it's almost the exact same thing on, this is what needs to change. And this is what we want to see. So right. it's nice that people are feeling that way. Um, so I guess it's looking forward how to start, uh, start that change and you right. know, there's there's i know a couple organizations out there like the the federation of state massage boards which they they're the one that they put out like a 43 page pdf on covid like the here's how here's what you need to clean in your office between sessions here's how often you need to clean your lobby your bathroom and whatnot i'm like that's cool like that's i believe that's what washington based most of their requirements for their massage therapist to open with um, and that's, those are the guidelines I used for my office, but it's like, wow, we had this institution I had not heard of pre COVID. And then right. now they have probably one of the best resources for massage therapists, you know, like, especially with what we're operating in now. So I'm like, cool. What does their curriculum look like? It's <laughs> so, like, can we start enacting this? And yeah, that's well, and I think, I think one thing that maybe we could, I don't really want to say base it off of. But I know when we had, when AMTA had their national sports massage team, you know, we had to take an exam. Um, and so everybody kind of had to know the same type of thing. And then we as examiners, you know, we're looking for specific things. So that kind of brought us together. Um, whether you can do that before they're even licensed in, in, in a school, I don't know. But um, I think some of those groups, and I don't know how many groups are out there. I'm, I'm more of a, a sports massage type of person. And those are the educations, I guess I mostly look at, but a lot of those groups, they really, you know, if people are interested in something, go take it and learn it. Whether it's working with um, pregnancy, cancer, any of those things, go and get the education. You know, I, I um, got certified in manual lymph drainage a couple of years ago. I don't plan to work at a hospital and I don't plan to, to advertise um, people that act, like after they've had mastectomies and stuff to come to me. But 
I've used it so much. I used it before that because we learned a little bit in school, but with sports injuries, mm -hmm. you know, um, with people just in general or knee replacement, things like that. It's amazing how well that works. But if people want to, to focus on something, it, we really have to stress continuing education and good continuing education. So it was hard this year having so many conventions canceled because uh, like national and even our state one, Benny Vaughn was coming to our state one. Mm. And I've been asking for that for 18 years since I've been <laughs> in Colorado. So I'm like, yay, he's finally coming for two days. And then it got canceled. Oh. So, yeah. so, but I, I think, I'm, I think that that's, that's the other thing is, is if we can't get the curriculum in the schools to be um, on the same level, then make sure we're stressing continuing ed. So. Okay. That's great. Wonderful answer. All great points. Um, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much for, for joining us. Thanks for being one of the uh, shining light in, in leading the way in massage therapy. So I appreciate it. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you for asking. Thank you for joining us, folks. The mission of Massage Tools Podcast is to inspire. So help us inspire you. Ask questions. Leave suggestions in the comments section. Give us a like if you enjoyed the video. And if you want to see more content, please click that subscribe button, turn on your notifications, and hey, check out these links for other videos here.